Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I wanted to talk to you today about your job and maybe being a little worried that uh, that job is either not going to be there when you graduate or it's not going to be there and you're in it now. And I've had a number of people reach out to me asking, you know, what would you do or what should I do uh, about my job? And I think it's easier to kind of explain this with a story and I got the idea for this answer from RX Radio. Uh, Dr. Richard Waith uh, has a great podcast and he had recently a guest, uh, Benjamin Jolly, who is a, a recent graduate at St. Louis College of Pharmacy. But what his, he had a story and I want to kind of take that story and, and put it into this to kind of talk about what it means to be an essential worker and that word essential gets thrown around a lot and there was a an NPR kind of quick update it's three minutes and in it they talk about how 1.4 million workers were laid off by hospitals in April obviously that's a bit scary for pharmacy for pharmacy world and you know the month before it was 40,000 workers so 40,000 to 1.4 million is quite a jump so if we're worried about losing our job we're worried about getting a job I know things have changed quickly Uh, Purdue and Manchester I think they're both Indiana schools allowed their students to graduate early because we thought there would be such a need for these healthcare workers only to find out that because the elective procedures were shut down it's not you know, what the hospital normally does, plus what they need to do with COVID. It's now replacing what they used to do with COVID. And now we're kind of opening up, uh, at least in Iowa, uh, we open up Friday in these other 22 counties. So what I do when I help somebody with their letter of intent is one of the primary things I do is make sure that this one thing is included in there that is critical for you to stand out and that's the question I get all the time is how do I stand out as a job applicant how do I stand out as someone who's applying to a residency and I want to talk about the difference between having a memorable story versus making a story memorable and you could kind of even take this more to having an interesting story to making a story interesting and let me tell you about the distinction if you have an interesting or memorable story it's one that when you started the story, it was something that the person was interested in. So let's say that these residents are in an academic medical center and they're really struggling to help the physicians uh, get enough heparin for the patients. And all of a sudden you come on with a presentation about getting heparin for patients when supplies are low that's now interesting to them it's of interest to them you know they want to know this they want that answer what usually happens is you have what's interesting to you and then you try to present it in a good way and you try to make it interesting you try to make it memorable so you know obviously how do you make that kind of story interesting well or of interest well you go backwards from what it is they're looking for and again there are 4,000 residencies out there and one of the number one mistakes students make is picking the wrong places to apply they apply to a place where they expect that you know their story will be they'll have made their story interesting enough that you know the person will want them so uh, let me kind of make this more concrete uh, with Uh, talking a little bit about uh, this RX radio episode and on the surface I think the title is uh, contracting and DIR fees and I I have no interest in in the topic necessarily except that you know getting rid of DIR fees would help pharmacy nation and that as a pharmacist that would be good for me I'm sure uh, in one way or another but I just enjoy RX radio I just enjoy uh, the stories that that come out whether no matter what the topic and uh, the pharmacist was a new grad his name's Benjamin Jolly I haven't met him 
uh, and he was providing a primer on pharmacy contracting, DIR fees. Uh, he has a consultancy uh, that he helps independent pharmacies, I, I assume, uh, with DIR fees, GER fees, or GER, which is generic equivalent something or other. And basically saving independence from PBMs or the practices they have. And when I kind of looked into you know, his background on LinkedIn. Uh, he went to school at Salt Lake City Center and studied Italian languages and literature. And I was like, that's really cool because I studied English as an undergrad. And I always am interested in those people that study the humanities uh, rather than maybe bio or chem or something like that before they go to pharmacy school because they tend to be able to articulate stories really well and have a really good understanding of things in a, a bit of a different way. It's kind of using the other half of your brain type thing. A uh, little background from LinkedIn. He was working at his family's compounding pharmacy, and he, he has really great stories about his grandfather and you know the time before refills and uh, things like that for a long time. And then he went to St. Louis, and I would love to talk to him, find out why he went to school 20 hours away. You know, I think St. Louis is 20 hours to the east driving of uh, Salt Lake. And I went to school, you know, 11 hours to the south from, you know, the Washington, D.C. area to, uh, you know, Gainesville, Florida. And I understand that, that, you know, desire to get away. And then it was cool that he came back. And just as I came back, although I went to Baltimore, not into Montgomery County, and he tells this great story about Lysanda, and Lysanda is a fentanyl citrate. Uh, this is not Lavaza, which is omega-3s. And he tells a story about how there's Lysanda, which every month this pharmacy would fill for $29,000. They would get a $1,000 uh, differential, so they'd make $1,000 a month on this medicine, only to find out that there was a some kind of 10% take back. So of the $30,000 they took back 10%. So the math was that 3, 000, this pharmacy lost $3,000, was paid $1,000, so had a net loss of $2,000 every month uh, serving this patient. And through his kind of understanding of how DIR fees work, how the computers work, and all of that, he was able to detect this, kind of advise the pharmacy on this, is how I understood the story. Now, let's think about that. Let's imagine, and I know many of you are going to hospital pharmacy, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but imagine that you're in a community pharmacy residency interview, and you're at an independent pharmacy. Pharmacy, obviously, is dealing with DIR fees and things like that. And then you drop this story on them. Like, well, you know, while I was working at I know he worked at Gateway Apothecary. I don't know if that's where this happened. Um, maybe it was one of the ones that he was a consultant at. I don't know. Uh, but let's say that you were working at an independent pharmacy while you were in school. And you had caught this. And maybe the pharmacy had spent, you know, had lost $24,000 in the past fiscal year. And then you tell the story and say, you know, I saved the pharmacy $24,000. Well, that's half your salary. In one sentence. And when we talk about someone who's essential, someone that saves $24,000 each year is an essential person. Someone who makes more money than the company spends on them is essential. And that's the thing I want to kind of drive home is that when you are worried about your job or losing your job, what is the definition of someone that is essential? In any company, someone that is essential is someone that brings in more money than the company spends on them. In this NPR article that, or three-minute article on the 1.4 million workers that lost their jobs, they interview a nurse who thought she was essential. And when that company or that hospital was doing those surgeries, she likely was essential to the surgery being performed properly and all of that stuff. But when the surgery is no longer being performed, the person is no longer essential. 
as you're going through your last year here, if you're going to apply for residencies or you're in PGY1 going to PGY2, what you want to do is start working on things that make you essential. And I think that when worry comes, your focus goes to the wrong place. Let me explain. When you're worried about your job, you're thinking about what will happen to you. What will you be able to afford? What will you not be able to afford? Are you getting paid what you should? Are you going to be able to work the hours you need so you can take care of your kids and all of those things? When your focus should be the opposite, your focus should be on, okay, well, what do I need to be doing to help other people? And right now, there are people that are still working and there are people that are not working. I assure you that no one that ever protested has ever been called out of line by the hiring manager anywhere and said, hey, you know, I saw you protesting. I just wanted to see if you wanted a job at such and such place, right? I understand the reason that you would want to protest certain things in this environment and so forth, but I'm telling you that that is part of the worry track. That is not part of the getting and making sure that you keep or get a job that you want. So I kind of put this in three spots. You're worried about having a job. And one of the things that I've done is to make sure that I have multiple jobs. And even if I don't have multiple jobs, I have multiple responsibilities within each job, which can transfer to other industries. So while I'm in education and you know I write books and things like that, I always take a class every semester. I know that many people are looking at, well, do I get a new master's degree? Do I get a new credential and things like that? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the classes and, and how I take them. Now, I take classes for free because I teach at a community college. And if there's an open spot in a class, I'm allowed to go in as long as I have permission of my boss. And so I took a videography class and I learned quite a bit about videography and that <laughs> I want very little to do with an actual you know, commercial or creating commercial. There's so much work that goes into it, getting the audio, uh, people for the audio. It, it takes a lot of people, a lot more than you would think. If you ever watch the show Nailed It, you think, okay, well, that's cool. You know, you get the three people who that are the hosts and you get the three people that are baking and, you know, how many people could possibly be behind the scenes. And then you see at the end, sometimes there's 20, 30 people just filming this thing. So there's a ton of people. But in that videography class, we really learn to work together. And I was freaked out at the beginning. He's like, okay, well, at one point in time during the semester, someone's going to be the director, someone's going to be producer, someone's going to be um, the DP, which is director of uh, production, uh, which is basically the cameraman, and then someone's going to be audio. And working with other people during COVID, I learned so much about working in groups. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic class. And the person that I learned from actually was the producer for the Jeff Foxworthy show. Community colleges have amazing gems in them uh, in terms of who are teaching at many places. I've also taken a class on social media, better understanding how to really use it to expand someone's reach. And then this summer I'm taking statistics or math. I've taken statistics before, but I was an undergrad. Uh, I have a reason for, for wanting to be better at teaching math. But in each case, I'm improving myself in some way. And I think that that's one big thing is to make sure that you're working on something that could get you your next job. Uh, the second is, you know, worrying about your job not paying enough. And what I keep seeing is that, again, people go to these master's degrees or credentials that are really, really expensive when it's a lot better to just get a second job for the experience, which may not pay a ton but you're getting experience doing what it is and really finding out if that's something that you want to go to. The third part is where I see people shifting or leaving a job without being really sure of where they're going. And my concern with that is that you have no idea what that industry is. Every industry has a what I would call a poop sandwich. You know, people say, oh my gosh, if I was only a surgeon making $400,000 a year. Well, surgeons get up pretty early. Surgeons work most weekends, you know, and so forth. And so there's kind of a lot going on with that that's undesirable. And each job has that kind of thing. So 
the number one reason for action or people leaving a job is dissatisfaction, burnout, and, and their person that works, their, their primary manager. But I think it's a mistake to leave without having gone through some of the experiences that would be in this new position, if that's available. Again, you may be displaced and it, you may just have to pick something up. So, you know, to kind of summarize all of this, what I do when I help somebody with their letter of intent isn't just, okay, well, I fixed your uh, comma splices and I, I fixed your and I edited your paper and I made it look good and and all of that. What we really wanted to do was get at the root of what your value is. And when you understand your value and the things that you're working for, just as you know Benjamin Jolly had with his Lazanda story, that he can save your pharmacy from DIR fees and uh, under, has a great understanding of a topic. If you listen to him, he, he tells stories in such a way that you are interested regardless of the topic. Regardless of the topic of DIR fees and contracting may not be interesting to you, but he's so proficient as it and tells these stories that are so good. Uh, it's really, really a tragedy that that more people don't get humanities degrees before you know pharmacy school. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, you know, kind of going back to this, the most important thing that you can do as you're applying for a job is find out what the story of interest is. What is the story? that this person wants to hear and not trying to tell your story in such an amazing way that they're interested in you. So if you're going to be a hospital pharmacist, you want to know, okay, well, when I was working in hospital pharmacy, you know, what was it that I saw where I was really creating solutions? And you don't have to know what their immediate problems are. You just have to be found as a problem solver, someone who picks up the mantle and gets things done. And if you've got enough of those stories, stories that are of interest to them, I can assure you that you'll always have a position. So that's my advice to you as you're kind of going through and navigating this kind of worrisome time. You want to change your mindset from, oh my gosh, I'm so worried about what's going to happen to me, to whose problems can I solve? Where do I really have an expertise where, you know, I would really do a great job? I've been watching uh, Netflix and there's this uh, Spanish language which has been translated money heist. Uh, it was La Casa de Papel. And Nairobi, one of the characters in there, if you get to watch this, it's just amazing. But she is the kind of HR director that just fires people up. And if you want to talk about an essential worker, it would be her. And you are just after she comes down, talks to the team, the team is just fired up again. And that's the kind of person that they're looking for. And that's the kind of person you want to be. So whether it's going to Netflix and watching Money Heist or whether it's uh, figuring out with the letter of intent where your value is and how you can help people, uh, those are the things that I would be working on now and making sure that you're continuing to improve. I know I went a little long with this one, but uh, if you do want help with your letter of intent or your cover letter for your job, do contact me at uh, TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com. Hey, thanks again for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. I do encourage you to go to ResidencyHelp.com, get on the mailing list. I'll send you out an email every Friday during residency season, but then afterwards uh, I'll still have a number of episodes uh, on helping you get through residency itself. Uh, and then if you're somebody that's looking at residency in the future, uh, I'll also have uh, content for that as well. Uh, if you have a question, I'm pretty good about getting back to you. And if I don't have an answer, I will know someone that does. Uh, so thanks again for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please do uh, rate and review. It really matters in terms of uh, our ability to reach more people. Thanks again.